great. Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the EIP panel eight. Um, we're going to be discussing election management bodies, sometimes shortened to EMBs today. Um, please note this panel is being recorded, um, but the recording will stop the Q&A. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for each panelist, uh, sorry, each presentation, uh, sometimes there's a couple of panelists. Um, so I'll give uh, our, our speakers a warning about two minutes before the time is up. Uh, we'll then hear from our discussant uh, and then move on to the Q&A. Um, so as the primary institutions tasked with running elections, uh, EMBs play a really critical role in realising electoral integrity. Um, but their task is not easy. Uh, a huge number of interrelated processes must be navigated over the course of the electoral cycle. Um, and EMBs today are embedded in increasingly complex governance networks um, and information environments. So those are presenting new challenges to an already um, very difficult job of election de delivery. So key questions that we're gonna touch on today um, will be around the weaknesses that we see uh, in EMB performance. Um, we'll also ask, uh, can EMB strengthen their processes and uh, build stronger relationships with key stakeholders? Um, and does the choice of electoral system impact election administration? So we've got a great mix of uh, single country and comparative research. So let me turn us over to uh, our first speaker. So uh, Cleo Ann Kalabahin is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Political Science and Development Studies at De La Salle University in Manila. Uh, please go ahead, Cleo. Uh, thank you. Good evening from Manila. I will be sharing my screen. So, um, Ferdinand Marcos won the Philippine presidency in a historic majority vote during the 2022 election. Although disinformation, historical revisionism, and authoritarian nostalgia are among the often cited factors that paved the way for Marcus Jr.'s landslide victory, little attention has been drawn to the contributing role of election administration in the 2022 Philippine presidential election. That the namesake of the former dictator was able to run for the highest public office and win with such a landslide is not an unexpected electoral outcome. Less than two months before the election day, the Commission on Elections displayed disputes among commissioners regarding the disqualification cases filed against Marcus Jr. The publicity over the issues surrounding the candidacy of Marcus included allegations of clientelistic ties involving powerful politicians allied with the administration and election officials. All this, however, was only symptomatic of a much broader problem vis-a-vis -vis election administration in the Philippines. In the Philippine case, the 2022 election process earned widespread approval despite multiple issues concerning Comelec's credibility and independence in administering the elections. A survey by Pulse Asia in June 2022 showed that 82% of Filipinos expressed their quote unquote big trust on the accuracy and credibility of the national and local elections. 14% were undecided, while only 4% conveyed distrust. Behind this purported success, however, lies an EMB that continues to exceed the low expectations vis-a-vis -vis holding a truly free, fair, honest, transparent, and credible electoral process. In view of this, the paper we've crafted evaluates the complex performance in the 2022 Philippine general election and we examined national and local election administration issues related to issues of autonomy and capacity that contribute both to the promise and pathology of democracy in the Philippines. How did the COMELEC or the Commission on Elections administer the 2022 election? 
What were the major issues on capacity and autonomy encountered during the electoral cycle? How did the election commission's adjudication and administration functions shape the conduct of elections? Centering the analysis on autonomy and capacity, we argue that the COMELEC's lack of decisive vote, voice and enforcement as a constitutionally independent body led to its failure to mitigate, if not fully prevent or address the challenges concerning election administration in the Philippines. So COMELEC deserves closer scrutiny because it's a constitutional commission and they're supposed to be able to fully and credibly deliver their mandate of administering elections with integrity. COMELEC is a constitutionally independent body mandated to manage and enforce all laws and regulations relative to the conduct of elections for the purpose of ensuring free, orderly, peaceful, and credible elections. But despite this, the COMELEC continues to exhibit substantial weakness. Looking at the 2004-2020 elections in the Philippines, COMELEC was found to have weak capacity and characterized by strong clientelistic relationships. The current law favors the chief executive in appointing commissioners and the possibility that autonomy is compromised given the influence of political elites, dynastic families in the Philippines remains. So just as a brief uh, overview of the election commission, under the administration of Corazon Aquino, reform through uh, having independent and competent commissioners uh, was there. It was an attempt to strengthen the COMELEC. However, the structure and the personnel of the commission was essentially the same organization that did the bidding of the previous dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos Sr. Reforms had limited traction given the institution's lack of capacity and succeeding administrations of Fidel Ramos and Joseph Estrada were likewise beset with allegations of clientelistic appointments. There is also, during the time of uh, the next president, um, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, a Hello Garcia scandal. This was a scandal that involved the president making a phone call to a Kamala commissioner and saying that she should lead by one million votes. And the commissioner Virgilio Garciliano responds by saying he will try to do something about it. The next president, Benigno Aquino, Jr. had a good governance platform. He appointed, a, unfortunately, he, he appointed a COMELEC chair who was beset with personal scandals that derailed, derailed possible reforms in the COMELEC. And appointments under the violent populist rule of Rodrigo Duterte was suspect of clientelism because his appointees were all either from his bailiwick, Davao, Mindanao, or came from the same law school as he did. So th there continues to be issues of padded voter registration, election violence, and vote buying in elections in the Philippines. These issues persist. It is uh, undeniable that across different critical junctures, the election commission has been suffering from elite capture and the lack of capacity building. It's consistently been hounded and pounded by these issues resulting in a credibility deficit. So with regard to the 2022 election, again, issues of autonomy and capacity, the composition of the commission was problematic because of uh, it's, it's led by a chairperson and six commissioners, and that's my, mandated by our constitution. And during the 2022 elections, five of the seven member came from Mindanao and two came, came from the same law school as the president. And one was the election lawyer of uh, two presidential candidates in that same election. Now the candidacy of Bongbong Marcos itself, you know, vetting should have taken place. Instead, the candidacy of Marcos Jr. was already controversial to begin with. He was convicted in 1995 for failing to file his income tax from 1982 to 1985. And petitioners argued that Marcus Jr.'s conviction should therefore have disqualified him from the race and barred him from holding any public office. The adjudication function of the COMELEC, however, um, and their first division ruled on this, dismissed the case against Marcus just almost just two months before the election for lack of merit. 
Not only did the, did the decision take a long period before it was released, thereby not, not leaving a whole lot of room for other petitioners to, to file the, a case if, if they disagreed with the ruling. But it also exposed internal conflicts within the commission. The public witnessed a commissioner accusing another Comelec commissioner of having clientelistic ties with politicians for both delaying the ruling and for ruling in favor of Marcus Jr. In another case, a local adjudication case, a Comelec commissioner ruled in favor of his nephew in a province where he himself used to be governor and where his uh, nephew and his brother are running for public office and where there were accusations of partiality, but these were brushed aside. In terms of issues of capacity, substitutions and withdrawals uh, was very common during the 2022 elections, and this involved the highest offices from uh, the individuals running for the highest office to local offices. So this was quite a political spectacle. And the COMELEC or the Election Commission could have declared these candidates as nuisance candidates, but instead they were allowed to be placeholders. And this has become a political strategy to delay who the real candidate will be. And when the commission was asked if they intend to regulate substitutions, uh, they responded that they would defer that to Congress. Because as Two far as Congress clear. is concerned, Okay, uh, I'll be wrapping up in a bit. Um, because as far as the commission is concerned, su substitution is still a valid procedure. There is a high cost of, of running for public office in, in the Philippines because of vote buying. And uh, local election administration officials have inadequate resources to monitor and implement election administration and election rules. Election violence continues to be rampant, and this includes um, violence against uh, election officials and election supervisors. So um, moving forward, we see that COMELEC lacked the decisive voice and action to be the independent constitutional body that it should be, and it continues to be plagued with issues of capacity and autonomy. The current COMELEC chair, has, is saying the right things by, by talking about reforms, but it remains to be seen how their performance will be in the uh, succeeding elections in 2025 and 2028. I'll end here and I, I look forward to the uh, uh, Q&A and, and uh, the comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting introduction to the 2022 election in the Philippines. Um, next up, we have uh, Catherine Re Murphy, who's research coordinator at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, or IFAS, uh, and Hannah Roberts, who is a consultant at IFAS for this project and an experienced practitioner on electoral observation and assistance. So, hand over to you. Thank you. We're going to start with Catherine, who's just in the process of sharing her screen. Hi, everyone. Can we see that OK? Wonderful. Uh, so my name is Catherine Murphy. I'm a research coordinator at IFAS. I'm here with Hannah Roberts. Um, and this project was also um, undertaken by Stefan Darnoff, also of IFAS. My computer's running a little bit slow today, excuse me. So I'll first go over the rationale kind of underpinning this research. So lessons learned processes, which refer to kind of a consultative um, after, after elections um, uh, evaluation of successes and shortcomings of a particular election are critical, but there's a really wide variation in practice globally um, about how they're undertaken. And there's no established guidelines, um, both for EMBs who are already holding these processes but are looking to improve, or for EMBs who are looking to hold one for the first time, um, but otherwise don't 
you know, know where to start. So the challenge with this type of research is, of course, how do we get EMBs to take notice of the guidelines and to actually implement them? So there are six key um, kind of principles that underpin our research. Um, so first, we wanted to focus on the process of developing the guidelines themselves and not just about the output and putting a report on the shelf. Um, also, given that an election involves a lot of you know, there, there are a lot of different stakeholders in any election. It was important for us to involve EMBs, which are the primary um, kind of entity administering um, a lessons learned process, um, but also a variety of other election um, actors, including international experts, donors, citizen observer groups, um, political parties and organizations that work with them and things like that. Um, it was also important for us to have a strong evidence basis. So we didn't want to just kind of opine on what we thought um, a successful lessons learned process was. Um, rather, we wanted to have um, evidence rooted in, you know, practices of EMBs and experiences of other, again, electoral stakeholders. We also wanted these um, guidelines to develop organically in response to partner input, um, which as Hannah will um, remember, <laughs> led our research project to become very expansive very quickly, um, which was ultimately great. Um, we also wanted to build consensus throughout the course of the project on what good practice actually is. So again, instead of at the end saying, okay, you know, we've come up with these guidelines, go make use of them. We wanted to ensure buy-in and usefulness throughout the entire process. And lastly, we wanted to empower EMBs with arguments and practical tools to actually implement these in their um, specific country contexts. So by the numbers, um, I'll just note that on Monday, we discussed kind of the full breadth of the research pro process, um, and we're happy to discuss that offline, but I'll just give a quick overview. Um, so we had 57 separate EMBs complete um, a survey. Um, and these represented all major regions. We had a pretty good um, geographic distribution. And this survey was also translated into five languages to ensure um, proper adoption. Um, a separate survey went out to election experts and we received 32 responses from that. We interviewed eight organizations working with political parties. Um, we held focus group discussions with nine citizen observer groups from around the world. Um, and then we also engaged four different development partners um, to get their insights. And just quickly, I want to go over the main findings of the EMB survey data. Um, so first off, there was a really high degree of consistency um, across the 57 responses in um, among questions like um, what makes um, a lessons learned process useful, what types of stakeholders should be engaged, and things like that. Um, over half of those surveyed do a lessons learned exercise of some type after every national election, um, although a fifth report never doing one. Um, a vast majority of them, even of the ones who um, do undertake some type of lessons learned process or exercise, don't have any written methodology for how these should be conducted. Um, despite this, there are multiple positive benefits that were noted by an EMB um, uh, that a lessons learned process can um, kind of have, including improved integrity or um, improved public standing. Um, better communication with stakeholders and things like that. Hannah will get into kind of more of the general benefits of lessons learned processes as well. Um, and then just to note, obviously with any survey, there's a good degree of um, selection bias given that, you know, we obviously can't mandate that people respond to our survey. So there's a little bit of um, opt-in selection um, as well as there's an affirmation bias. So obviously given that this is an EMB survey, um, we um, ensured that responses were anonymous and that was communicated to participants. But of course, there's a certain degree of um, affirmation bias and wanting to make the EMB look good, um, which certainly impacted the data. Um, and then to combat, you know, to ensure that it wasn't just EMB, EMB voices that were included in this research process, we also included, as mentioned before, a variety of other voices from citizen observers, organizations that work with parties, um, international experts and others. Um, so then to get into the meat of the findings themselves, I'll pass it over to Hannah. Thank you, Catherine. So after doing all of this extensive research, we then had the challenge of coming up with a draft that would uh, meet these different objectives that we have and hopefully be something that many organizations, including EMBs, but also the wider election community could identify with in the hope that we could help establish some sense of good practice standards. So the, the first thing we did was produce an initial draft, which then went for extensive review through all the different partners that we worked with at an international level. Also a number of selected EMB officials, selected experts who have particular experience in this area and IFAS colleagues. 
At the moment, we now have a second version, which has just gone out to partners again, which we think is more or less final. And we hope that it will be coming out in the next few months once we've got the last bit of feedback and done the layout, etc. Broadly, the shape of the guidelines is that the first part is really an overview of why do a lessons learned process, what the key points would be of how to approach it and key steps to take. Then we go into more detail on some of the issues involved, particularly around inclusion and accessibility, a separate chapter on concerns and risks that EMBs may have in the process and some thoughts on mitigating, me mitigating measures and finally working with international partners. Then there's a very long section, which is the step by step of different step of different actions an EMB can take in order to implement a meaningful lessons learned process. We've tried not to be prescriptive, but to have them as a reference point that people can use if they want to consider how they might strengthen their processes. And finally, some annexes, which goes more into the methodology that we followed and the findings and includes example templates that EMBs can use if they wish. Um, just to go over some of the content of this, in terms of why do lessons learn, the benefits that really came through from the research with EMBs and others was firstly that it gives an evidence basis for EMBs to be making changes. So it makes it easier for them to argue with stakeholders, to argue for funding and to make more realistic and practical changes. So obviously we hope that that would then improve elections. And in doing that would also build an institution's resilience because it has a broader basis on which it's making decisions, it's work with stakeholders, so hopefully it would be more able to, to manage shocks as the, um, that may come in the future. Thirdly, by working in a consultative way throughout a lessons learned process, that would increase collaboration and therefore trust from stakeholders that an EMB can make improvements, that elections will be better can also enhance an EMB's credibility, therefore, and their ability to show leadership and authority and all the benefits that go with that in terms of a smooth election process, but also an EMB being able to influence other actors to obtain funding, etc. Another area that was strongly emphasised was the benefit there can be to internal functioning with improving communication and people understanding how leadership decisions made and being more willing to implement them if they feel part of that process. Also, uh, another point that was emphasised is in encouraging more responsible behaviour by stakeholders by identifying what an EMB is doing, but also what other shortcomings there may be in electoral processes. It puts more onus on the responsibility that different actors have and sets things up at the start of an election cycle when there is still time for change. Uh, so overall, the benefits of these is hopefully, as we say, improved and more accepted election processes. And then the knock on benefits there can be towards mitigating the risk of election violence in the future and also defending democratic space. So that's the sort of why do lessons learned. Then we came on to the key principles for how to do a meaningful Two minutes, lesson. Hannah. Thank you. The Thanks. key principles for how to do a, lesson, a lessons learned process in a meaningful way. And the first one is really to establish a framework in advance, well before an election, so that people know what they need to do to meaningfully contribute to it. And they can be involved in the design of it. So again, stakeholders are on board and can, can contribute more substantially to the process. Second principle, gather as much information as possible. So and that involves undertaking meaningful consultation with people. So making it safe for people to take part whereby they can criticize and EMB will listen to that criticism. Fourth principle, be constructive. So that involves acknowledging shortcomings and focusing on ways forward rather than attributing individual blame. Fifth point, having clear balanced conclusions that people can understand and very specific recommendations that can be that are linked to planning going forward and that these recommendations are then subject to monitoring in the future and there's a monitoring plan. And finally, being transparent and accessible about the process. So these principles we then transferred into sort of key, six key actions that really equate with these principles about starting early, gathering information, etc. And then, as I say, we break them down into a step by step of how to do these in a meaningful way. Uh, just very quickly to mention some of the concerns and risks that we address so that, that an EMB will be exposed, look weak, could stir up controversy, stakeholders won't agree with the report, that it happens too late that the EMB won't be able to implement changes. So we've tried to foresee 
what concerns EMBs would have so that they can be more easily addressed. So just finally to say the strong emphasis that was put on having such an evidence base and involving EMBs, we hope, um, we think has really helped uh, enable a coherent approach to lessons learned which we think is demonstrated by the number of organizations that uh, are adding their logo to this publication when it comes out. So we've currently got 12. So that includes various EMB networks, development partners, technical assistance providers, international, um, uh, sorry, intergovernmental organizations, observer networks. So as I say, our intention is that this gives a really clear signal about the importance of lessons learned exercises as a critical step from one election to the next and a critical way of using that period between elections and also shows consistency and a good a sense of good practice of how to do it in a meaningful way. And finally, just to say it's work in progress. We have to work out how we don't just drop the report, but actually engage people so that hopefully it can be a living thing that's subject to review later. And a very final point of thank you to Swedish CEDA who've financially supported this very elaborate process. Look forward to any questions you may have and discussion points. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah and Catherine. Um, that was really interesting and I think um, anyone who's been involved in, in election observation and assistance knows that that's a key part of the process that often um, gets gets missed out or, or not given the attention that it perhaps needs because everyone's exhausted after the process. Um, so we're moving on next to uh, Bailey Didman, who is a senior research officer, uh, and Zeynab Shah, in, who's the digital democracy coordinator both based in IFIS's Centre for Applied Research and Learning. Uh, they'll be presenting practical guidelines for strengthening EMB and political party relationships through improved communication and coordination. So over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sonali. And um, thank you, Zainab, for, for sharing your screen. We look forward to presenting on this ongoing research project um, led by IFIS, the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. Um, so while Zainab's screen is loading, I'll just dive into the introduction to tell you a bit more about the need for this project. Um, so tensions between electoral management bodies and candidates and political parties have soared in recent years. And this is due to a number of factors. So whether they're is mis or distrust um, towards EMB, uh, given inaccurate flows of information um, or exacerbated uh, political polarization. And some of this can be explained by the lack of or poor channels of communication and coordination between these actors. Um, and at times, the lack of institutional capacity, financial or human resources, or simply planning by the part of the EMB to establish and use effective communications mechanisms with political parties is just enough to open fissures in this relationship, given the tension that surrounds elections. So our research um, is gathering lessons learned and identifying good practices for EMBs and political parties to interact and share information to increase political party compliance, EMB transparency, engagement with key stakeholders, and overall trust in the elect in the integrity of the electoral process. I'll pass it over to Zainab now to share more about the methodology. Great. So for the global scoping study, um, we divided our study into two phases. So for the global scoping study, we reviewed internal materials from programming as well as external materials, which included EMB websites, country legal frameworks, uh, EMB meeting minutes, and we ended up reviewing data from more than 50 countries during this phase of the project. We also surveyed academic and practitioner literature to find what kind of mechanisms exist, how engagements take place in different contexts, and how this impacts the integrity of the electoral process. We couldn't find a comprehensive literature review on the topic, so much of the data for the study was obtained through informational interviews with in-country experts. And then we ended up conducting over 35 interviews. Sorry, Zainab, I think your, um, your slides are frozen. My slides are frozen? Yeah, it seems to be stuck on the first page. Ooh, okay, let me try to go back. Apologies. Sorry. 
Can you guys see my screen now? It's loading. Any better? So you can see the screen, but it's still on the first slide. It's not going past the first slide. It doesn't seem to, no. It's on the kind of presenter page. Um, yes, there we go. That's moving again. Yeah, great. Okay. And then can you put it on presentation mode? It is on presentation mode. Are you guys seeing it now? Yeah, we, we can see. Good. Yeah. Okay. So just to just to continue, can you guys see the methodology page at the moment? That's the one I have up. Um, no, it seems to be back on the front page again. <laughs> that's odd. I might just ask Fernanda or Bailey to share their screens if it's working better on their end. Sorry, guys, for. No problem, Zina. Why don't you continue with the methodology and I'll try to um, share screen. Well, that sounds good. Great, thanks guys. I'm sorry about the tech issues. I don't know why my screen isn't sharing. Um, but just to continue, we, we surveyed academic and practitioner literature. We couldn't really find a lot of mechanisms. So we ended up conducting um, interviews with in-country experts. So based on our findings from the global scoping study, we went ahead and selected nine cases for deeper country studies. And then in this phase, we were directly soliciting perspectives from EMBs and political parties on recommendations for improvements by conducting semi-structured interviews. So the goals of the interviews is to get different perspectives on how well these mechanisms are working and then just identify areas of improvement. So in terms of just our selection, selection criteria, we used we looked at mechanisms in use, access to stakeholders and geographic diversity, but we wanted to make sure that a variety of contexts were represented. So we reviewed our country lists against the varieties of democracy database, which included regime types, EMB autonomy and EMB capacity. Over to you, Billy. Thank you, Zainab. I'm confirming you can see the list of identified trends. Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thanks for bearing with us during these technical glitches. Um, so through our first phase of research, we identified five key trends as through lines um, based on the EMB structure um, and existing mechanisms in use. Um, so first, we, we noticed that some countries have distinct mechanisms for this type of communication established in their legal frameworks, whereas other countries do not. Um, for a certain context, this, uh, you know, mentioned in the legal framework explicitly defined the pace of communications with EMBs, um, the timing of communications with EMBs, as well as who was included in these um, communications with EMBs, whether it was relevant for all political parties within the country or just political parties um, that had presence or elected members in parliament. Um, in addition, uh, some countries we found are well resourced enough to have distinct and established units within their EMB that are solely dedicated to communicating with political parties, whereas many other countries um, go for more ad hoc efforts. So, for example, INE in Mexico has four distinct departments, each with individual roles responsible for communications and coordination with political parties, whether that pertains to political finance um, and reporting or or electoral training, um, candidate disclosure forms, or registration. Um, for, for countries or EMBs where there is not um, an established unit, sometimes it is challenging to determine whose mandate it is um, to be responsible for these communications. Um, and this may fall onto one commissioner who's responsible for financing or for political party relationships. In addition, we noticed that some EMBs avoid a interacting exclusively with political parties. Um, and this can be due to presumptions of compromise independence, or EMBs don't have dedicated mechanisms for interaction with political parties, and they rely on general communications channels. So when sharing out um, dates and other resources for candidate registration that go out to the mass public, they consider that to be communications with the electoral management bodies. Um, we noted in other, uh, other contexts that uh, EMBs were wary 
wary of directly uh, dealing with political parties due to increasing political polarization or ongoing efforts by political parties um, to establish mistrust in the EMB and the electoral system. We also noted that of, of EMBs that do interact with parties and candidates, some EMBs do this throughout the entirety of the electoral cycle, um, while others limit meetings to the immediate electoral period. For example, in Honduras, it is enshrined in the, the legal framework um, that a temporary advisory council of political parties will be set up one year in advance of the electoral cycle. Whereas in New Zealand, we saw that there were dedicated points throughout the entirety of the electoral cycle in which the EMB um, communicated with political parties, starting from registration to, you know, lessons learned exercises at the end of the election cycle. And then finally, um, EMB structure we found matters. So while some countries have political parties represented on their EMB board, um, we found that sometimes that you know, conflated with direct access and direct communication to their political representatives. Um, while in other EMBs that are independent in nature or where com uh, commissioners are appointed or based on their technical expertise, there wasn't that direct line or perceived line of communication with the political parties. So I'll pass it over to Zainab now to explore the individual mechanisms. So we won't have a chance to go through all of them, but we'll just call out the most interesting ones. So specific divisions within the EMB with mandates to work with political parties. Um, so in certain countries, EMBs have specific divisions or offices that coordinate directly with political parties and their mandates vary significantly. So sometimes it's just managing political finance reporting. Uh, and at times it's hosting regular meetings on all aspects of the electoral cycle. For instance, in Brazil, the Superior Electoral Court uh, has established the Office for Assistance with Parliamentary Articulation that deals exclusively with political party communications. And in Iraq, the Independent High Electoral Commission has a political parties department, which was established by law that's responsible for registering parties and then election day coordination and monitoring campaign finance. And then another interesting common mechanism is dedicated websites and portals. So many EMBs have dedicated pages or sections for political parties on their websites, which frequently uh, feature updates. And these could include links to party-specific regulations, guidance on candidate, candidate registration, or political finance reports. But then some EMBs actually have password protected portals for polit political party representatives on their websites. So that would be places like Ecuador, Honduras, Canada, South Africa, and New Zealand. And then other interesting mechanisms include consultative advisory councils. So such mechanisms serve as designated space for advice and consultation between EMBs and political parties. We found that this practice was quite common in Africa. For example, both in Ghana and Nigeria, there are active inter-party advisory councils. And in Ghana specifically, the IPAC is a institutional mechanism for consensus building amongst political parties and the election commission. And then another interesting mechanism is the post-election lessons learned exercises. So in some countries, including Nepal, South Africa, and Ethiopia, the election commission will hold meetings with political parties after the election to get their feedback on the full process. And in New Zealand, the legal and policy division is actually legally mandated, mandated to include individual party feedback in their post-election report to parliament. Over to you, Billy. Two minutes, thanks. Thank you, Sonali. So what are the implications of these mechanisms? Um, you know, we included eight on the screen. We uncovered more in the research. However, we recognize it's not a one size fit all model. Um, and in the recommendations that we produce with the final guidebook, um, we're looking to very much tailor uh, the, the recommendations for the scope, the size, the structure of the EMB. Um, and so three, three key um, implications that we would like to highlight are financial. So what resources does the EMB um, have available for these efforts? Are there ways ways in which the EMB can advocate for the creation of someone's portfolio that deals with, um, you know, political party communication relationship building, or perhaps there are more low cost, um, effective mechanisms that can be in use, such as, um, you know, transparently posting deadlines or meeting minutes available on the website or opening up um, meetings with political parties to a broader scope of, of candidates. 
Um, there are also legal implications. So in certain cases, EMBs are legally obligated to meet with parties. They're legally obligated to have certain transparency measures. Um, in other cases, the EMB is legally prohibited from doing certain things. Um, for example, one, one instance in Brazil where there is a dedicated unit the head of the division um, must record all of his interactions with political parties in the effort of transparency. In the case of New Zealand, you know, as Zainab said, um, that is, is very developed in this regard. In the lessons learned exercises, they legally have to produce a report that is then sent to parliament. Um, but in countries where there's no mention of this communication and the legal framework, what can they do and what can they advocate for um, in their own governments to enshrine this, this mechanism or, or this process um, for future use in electoral cycles? Um, and then finally, there are, of course, political implications um, given the, the varying nature of structures and EMBs. So to what extent does partisanship impact communication? Um, do commissioners interact with political parties informally via WhatsApp or Instagram channels um, where there is perceived political polarization or rampant misinformation about the EMB? How does the EMB make sure to um, you know, maintain its independence and its perceived independence by communicating with uh, political parties. And so there are transparency efforts and mechanisms that can be in use to do so. So then finally to conclude, um, to just highlight briefly next steps. So as Zainab said at the top, we are in the process of conducting in-depth interviews with key electoral stakeholders. We are doing this project jointly with the National Democratic Institute, NDI. So whereas IFAS will be interviewing current and former election commissioners and dedicated EMB staff um, who work on these subjects, NDI will be interviewing leads, um, secretariats, and the like of political parties to get their perspective on what works, what doesn't, and what needs to be done. Um, this will culminate in the development of practical guidelines coming later this year, where we expand on these mechanisms and we'll be producing um, useful annexes for EMBs um, to be able to, to take these lessons learned and potentially apply them in their own uh, you know, context. And then finally, we'll be producing training materials um, so that they can be integrated into existing curricula or workshops um, to highlight the importance of communication and coordination between EMBs and political parties. So with that, thank you so much for your time and I'll pass it back to you, Sonali. Thank you, Bailey and Zainab. That was really interesting. And I think um, particularly this, this question of how you balance uh, maintaining the EMB autonomy with uh, the necessary communications that need to go on between EMBs and that kind of relationship and trust building with the parties and the EMBs is a really important balance to strike. Um, okay, next up we have uh, Eduardo Repeloso Fernandez, who is the General Director at Transpar Transparencia Electoral. Um, he's going to talk to us about election integrity in Argentina and transparency de deficits of subnational election management bodies. Over to you, Eduardo. Thank you, Sonali, and thank you, everybody. Can you confirm you can see my screen? Yeah, that's great. Perfect, thank you. Well, I, we do appreciate um, the, the space in the, uh, in the conference. Uh, and we do appreciate everybody who has joined. Um, today, I'm going to present the conclusions of one of our main studies that we um, actually just published. Um, uh, the, but, but I'm going to be highlighting one of the conclusions, which is the transparency deficits of subnational election management bodies in, uh, in Argentina. As you may know, Argentina is a country that is highly decentralized, uh, has a highly decentralized election uh, administration system, uh, pretty much uh, not as much as the US, but perhaps um, as a federal country, as much as Brazil and um, and um, uh, Brazil and Mexico uh, is perhaps more similar. I'm trying to just pass the, and it's not allowing me, so just give me, there you go. So the objective of the of the um, index that we built around election integrity in Argentina, this is actually the third edition that we have published. 
um, takes into account the conditions of the 2021 elections, which is the previous election that happened uh, before the study and the changes that have happened to electoral systems at a subnational level until 2023, until now. And the index, what we try to do is assess the levels of election integrity uh, in each province um, or, or state to make data-driven recommendations to improve the quality of elections and strengthen democracy. The methodology is pretty, um, uh, well, perhaps this is a long story made short, but um, uh, the document uh, on the methodology is online and, and um, everybody's welcome to, to, to check and let, it all, uh, let us know um, their comments. The, um, the basically, we uh, base uh, the analysis in three dimensions, election, legal framework, equality and access to political rights, and democratic competitiveness. Um, the index then uses three categories to classify each province. Um, low election integrity, moderate election integrity, and high election integrity. Um, the electoral legal framework basically is the analysis of the rules under which elections are held in each state or each district, where opportunities and threats of subnational democracy um, are identified and the way in which these determine the election results. Uh, also, the equality and access to political rights, it includes the indicators, uh, media coverage analysis, which we try uh, to we do try to um, the sample that we take we try to make sure that each uh, you know we select two media outlets um, regional media outlets and we try you know for them to be for the coverage uh, that they do to be as balanced as possible of course this can't really um, be ensured so what we do is that uh, we ponder the score is not the same that we give to the media coverage analysis um, that we do to other um, uh, indicators that are included in the legal election legal framework, for example. But um, it does help give us a, um, an idea of what's happening on each level in each district. We also include a perception, a perception of specialists, which is basically a um, survey that we do of specialists, election experts here in Argentina. Uh, for each district, and then we assess the level of access to information, um, which is one of the points that I'm going to hi be highlighting here. Uh, also, democratic competitiveness is a, is a variation of a subnational democracy index, which is actually not our, it's not an index that we devised, it's actually an index proposed by uh, Carlos Gervasoni, which is, a, which is a professor here in, in Argentina, who is well known for studying uh, democracy at the subnational level. So. Um, here, um, what I try to do is usually just give everybody an idea of what support for democracy as a political system in Argentina has been like since 1995 to 2020. This is not data that we have gathered. This is um, uh, the source of this is Latino Barometro, which m many of you may know. Um, it's a well recognized um, um, uh, survey uh, that uh, is based out of Chile that actually um, does you know, gather this kind of uh, social preferences by country, right? So one of them is here in Argentina, 67% um, is the percentage of people who believe that um, uh, up until 2020, democracy was preferable to any other form of government. And what is actually uh, worrisome here is that 17% of these people that were surveyed, um, they believe that, you know, for ordinary people, it's it doesn't really matter uh, uh, if it's a, a democratic regime or not, um, uh, as because it kind of it doesn't have any consequences on ordinary life, right? And also another fifteen percent um, does believe that in certain particular circumstances, an auditor an authoritarian um, government may be preferable. Um, so the same happens with uh, uh, satisfaction with the way that democracy works in Argentina. Um, up until 2020, the percentage that, um, that expressed or felt that they were satisfied or more so-and-so satisfied with democracy, with the way that democracy was working has been shrinking significantly um, as opposed to those who feel that they're not at all satisfied or not very satisfied. Um, so um, that is basically one of the reasons why, uh, that's ju justification behind the index is this, right? This climate in which 
people start to believe that um, democracy is not always the best form of government, you know, that it's kind of, it depends on the conditions and the situation. One of the main changes to, to subnational election uh, systems since 2021 have been um, one, um, governments still use, uh, at the state level, uh, governments still use some election engineering devices, um, such as uh, Ley de Lemas, which is basically a system that makes a general election work as a primary. Um, basically what it does is that it computes votes for other candidates within the party. So it's like an election for parties instead of candidates. Um, that's, <laughs> again, another long story made short, uh, but is it's it's a it's a tendency here in Argentina. In fact, two more states started using this um, uh, this uh, contraption, this mechanism, in their provinces to kind of maximize political um, capital and uh, and uh, kind of tilt the field in favor of 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 the government. The candidate suitability field. Um, there's five provinces. You know, not not everything has been uh, 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 bad. Uh, Five provinces have implemented Ficha Limpia, which is basically um, uh, an initiative that um, is meant to guarantee the candidates haven't been condemned for particular crimes. It ranges from corruption to sexual abuse, um, and so this we believe is a is a good um, uh, it's a good indicator, and that is how we we so we evaluate it positively. You know, the provinces that have adapted have adopted this initiative, we do tend to. Um, evaluate uh, positively. So voting instrument, uh, uh, as it regards to the, to the voting instrument, there's six provinces who have implemented a different uh, voting instrument than what is used on the federal level, which we do believe has a lot of vulnerabilities and does not guarantee free, uh, sorry, uh, does not guarantee a fair election for all parties. So we do tend to evaluate in, in a positive way that these provinces have implemented the single ballot, which is basically a ballot that gathers all the candidates and all the election offer in just one ballot, as opposed to the one that is used uh, on a federal level and in the rest of the provinces here in Argentina, which basically um, um, fragments the, off the, the offer, the election offer, and, it's, it, and, and it becomes, um, it's a very cumbersome instrument and very, uh, and it has a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, so, Two minutes. Yeah. So regarding the data analysis, basically, you know, what we discovered is that uh, more than 20 percent of the irregularities that are reported on the media, basically, they use um, or they abuse state resources in favor of, 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 of one party or, or 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 in favor of the government. And then uh, also more than 20 percent is related to the instrument, to the voting instrument. Um, these is basically, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but uh, this is one of the um, one of the ways that we assess um, the, the the election systems on a state level. Um, as you can see, uh, on when it comes to opening election data, most of the provinces don't have most of the EMBs just don't really have any kind of uh, program or initiative to open election data. And uh, this is the result of the uh, of the map. Basically, is a it's a heat map of what um, uh, you know of, of how we believe or how we assess election integrity in each in each in each of the states. Um, you're welcome again to to review this on our website. But the conclusions of the study is basically that the voting instrument is too vulnerable and does not guarantee a fair competition, which is what we have um, uh, seen in the in in, in the, what what the media gathers in each uh, for each election. Citizen election observation is not regulated by law, which is which allows for important discretionality in its application. In 2021, we had a few issues um, observing elections here in in, in Buenos Aires and here in, uh, and also in, in one of the provinces. Uh, the the figure that is used here is very limited and it's not very known by any not even uh, the staff that administers the election on a, on, on each polling station. Um, opening election data is not part of the EMB's agenda, which is a concern of ours. And election system engineering is still a common resource of subnational governments to do in their case. So um, the lack of, a, of open, open election data, basically what the risks and concerns that we identify is that first, EMBs need to build capacity to collect and publish the data, which requires resources, which they don't have. 
Also, there's a limit to the data that domestic election monitors, such as Transparencia Electoral and other academic groups can gather on the ground without the EMB's involvement. So this compromises our ability to promote database policies to improve the quality of elections. And then third, uh, but perhaps the most, you know, the, our, our most our biggest concern is that these data voids that are uh, uh, created by the lack or the absence of quality data online generally feed into disinformation campaigns. Now, Argentina has been exempt in some way to the fraud narratives that have been going around in the United States, in Brazil, in Mexico, Colombia. But um, it, the, 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 some of the things, you know, these data voids that we see are forming here in Argentina, which is substantial, we do believe that is a risk for disinformation campaigns to uh, perhaps uh, gain ground or gain force uh, in election cycles. And it only takes just one actor to kind of activate these um, these, these threats. So that's one of the things why, um, how do we move forward? You know, what one of the things that we're gonna be advocating for, uh, it's not only the change of the instrument, it's not only regula regulating uh, domestic election observation by law, which we've already been doing for, for a number of years, but um, we do believe that opening election data is 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 really it's one of the things that we're going to be we're going to be advocating for because it's one of the risks that we identify for uh, election systems uh, as a whole and the subnational level, but also on the federal level here in Argentina. Brilliant, thank you so much, Eduardo. And I think that's uh, that's ties in well with the lessons learned discussion. Is sort of having this information available. Uh, it really does contribute to um, transparency. All right, and our final presentation um, is uh, from Ivan Jarabinsky, who is a researcher working on elections and electoral integrity at Institute H21, which is based in Prague in the Ch uh, Czech Republic. Um, so his presentation is entitled Heads and Tails of a Single Coin, Examining Electoral System Requirements for Election Electoral Administration. Go ahead, Ivan. So I hope you can see my uh, slides now, do you? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much also for having me as I'm a big fan of Electoral Integrity Projects since its uh, foundation back in 2012 or 13 when I started to uh, search for the topic of my dissertation. So since then, I really, I really like what you are doing, and I just hope you will, you will keep doing. Uh, I want to present you the, my uh, paper with my colleagues uh, Miroslav Libal and Jan Oreski, and when we are dealing with examining electoral system requirements for electoral administration. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so our initial motivation was uh, that uh, as we work at the Institute H21, uh, we are supposed to focus on a very uh, specific voting method called D21 and the Czech method, which uh, we are approaching for a comparative perspective. And uh, one of these perspectives uh, 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 was supposed to be also electoral administration, as, uh, uh, as I prefer to make it clear. Uh, also, uh, we when when we observe some discussions uh, among politicians, people, or 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 maybe sometimes other scholars, uh, we hear often that uh, if we uh, do some new electoral reform and we we want if we want some new uh, voting system, uh, they are often really scared that it's uh, the new rules would be too complicated. That, that voters wouldn't understand the new rules or that administration uh, maybe uh, wouldn't manage to uh, to uh, run such a complicated voting rules and so on. So in general, we were interested in how well our various electoral systems managed with respect to their administration. Uh, then we realized that we really don't know much about any other electoral system as, as uh, speaking about uh, complexity of electoral systems, uh, scholars usually speak about how complicated electoral rules are, or uh, they speak about computational complexity, but we really observe that we really don't know uh, too much about 
uh, administrative complexity of electoral systems. The only uh, like work or and the cornerstone of our uh, research is this uh, tiny book uh, from Reynolds, Rayleigh and Ellis from 2005, uh, Electoral System Design, the New International Idea Handbook. Uh, you probably all are familiar with it, uh, but as it is uh, more designed for electoral practitioners, I would say, uh, uh, it's not really an academic article, uh, and uh, it's uh, based on, uh, it, it is the first uh, work which links uh, administrative complex, complexity of electoral systems uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, administrative demand with their administrative demands. Uh, in general, speaking about simplicity and complexity, uh, we some somehow take them for granted. For instance, when we speak about first past the post, and we say that uh, it's a simple voting method, everyone agrees. Uh, if we speak about alternative voting. Uh, Everyone agrees that that it's complicated, uh, it, it's complex voting system, but uh, it really is not in every aspect uh, too complicated. And uh, similar, it is with uh, with the first pass the post. Uh, in general, um, the adjustment of uh, of uh, elect uh, electoral administration is taken merely as a technical. A reform in adaptation to electoral systems, but as Clark nicely put it, uh, administrative adjustments may bring costs to the already expensive management of national elections, which in my eyes makes this argument, makes the electoral administration uh, even potential uh, cause for electoral reform, and, and it makes it pretty important aspect of electoral system. Uh, as I said, Reynolds, Rayleigh, and Ellis's book is like sort of uh, one of a kind. Uh, the closest uh, uh, research in academia we found was this book from Pippa Norris on electoral integrity from 2015, but it's it's pretty far from what we are doing as uh, she concludes that proportional representation has a positive linkage to electoral integrity, while proportional representation systems are too broad category and uh, so uh, so electoral integrity is too broad concept so it basically doesn't say uh, much about what we were searching for so we are uh, generally interested <clears throat> in whether the administrative complexity of electoral systems affect the quality of electoral administration we had some expectations based on Reynolds, Rayleigh and Ellis so we expect that some electoral systems are more prone to poorer performance uh, in certain aspects of electoral administration than others. What we did is <clears throat> that we took uh, uh, Reynolds, Rayleigh and Ellis uh, comparative table of, uh, of how electoral systems are administratively complex uh, with respect to several specific administrative consequences and we basically, but but uh, Reynolds, Rayleigh, and Ellis, uh, they had like several these administrative consequences, these dependent variables. While we were able to take just four of them for our comparative uh, purpose because of the of the lack of the data, and one of their uh, dependent variable, we we to two which is which is the count and counting results uh where count stands for how um how the staff in polling stations uh count the votes voting ballots while the counting results stands for the rest of the process and how timely consuming it is um uh as i said we took these uh five variables and what we did is that we tried to link them as accurately as possible with the data from uh, perception of electoral integrity data set uh, and uh, I'm not going into detail but uh, uh, but uh, we we simply did our best to uh, to um, express uh, the definitions uh, from uh, from uh, Reynolds Rayleigh and Ellis. 
Uh, we then run um, ordinary least square regression uh, where uh, into independent variables, we put like the basic repertoire of, uh, of uh, independent variables from similar studies. And before I will uh, present you with the result, to uh, Leontin for uh, sending you the uh, the present the early version of the presentation because when I was preparing for Q and A's potential Q and A's I asked for some descriptive statistics and we realized that uh, we really shouldn't do the models as we did so we had to uh, uh, left out some categories of electoral systems which. Uh, but but uh, basically uh, the results really didn't change for for the rest of them. So the sort of newer results from yesterday <laughs> are are uh, very similar, and uh, and uh, the models are, are uh, seems to explain quite a uh, quite a lot as uh, the R square go adjusted goes from uh, forty six to uh, sixty four percent of of uh, explanation of the variance of the dependent variable variables uh it's uh but as i said the results are uh really similar to what i sent you earlier uh it's still about and mostly about electoral management bodies so the 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 quality of electoral administration let's say in these five aspects is mainly derived by the capacity of electoral management body and uh, also by uh in more general culture of professional public uh administration and in two cases it's also driven by by electoral management bodies autonomy uh electoral systems on the, thanks yeah, yeah electoral systems on the other hand uh seems mostly insignificant for for the for the dependent variables uh i don't, i'm not sure if you can see the orange orange uh, color in the in the boxes but uh if you can uh, so it stands for uh the cases where we expected differences which didn't occur based on these uh, theoretical different uh, expectations uh and uh, uh one of the cases uh which is the parallel voting is uh doesn't differ well i forgot to say that in the constant there is first past the post and uh and uh, parallel voting uh uh more positively influence the the voter registration compared to the first past the post or while it was expected that it should be probably the same uh a similar i would say uh and the only only difference is uh in drawing boundaries and voter registration where uh where uh which are like the polar opposites in respect of how drawing electoral boundaries and voter registration are defined by Reynolds, Rayleigh, and Ellis, who uh, who basically define them based on the size of the of the constituencies. So it it it's pretty uh, evident that uh, these two voting methods are like polar opposites with respect to the size of voting constituencies in general so uh if i can conclude uh the electro electoral systems complexity really doesn't play a significant role in the quality of electoral administration electoral management bodies must be uh, first of all well equipped and prepared and uh, they should work in the under the culture of professional public administration electoral management body out but its autonomy is not decisive as a uh, capacity and professionality variables, but uh, it's still important in some critical spheres of, of drawing boundaries and the count. And uh, I would say that uh, theoretical expectations of electoral systems uh, are overestimated in this regard. Uh, well working electoral administration under new electoral rules can be taken for granted only in a very specific administrative contexts. And uh, I still believe that it is good to be aware of, of these administrative context, uh, complexities and specifics uh, of various electoral methods, uh, but the potential problems can be mitigated through electoral administration. So that's all from me. Thank you for uh, your patience.